Why do people go to hell? Um, we don't have too many messages on hell. Uh, we, we don't read very many books about it. We don't watch a lot of podcasts about it, listen to podcasts, any of that. Uh, it's a topic that on the whole, really, we just want to avoid most times. Uh, this, I, I really don't want to teach on it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so difficult. But it's, it's um, a, a very serious reality the Bible talks about. Um, there's so many positives, I think, in Christianity that I'll, we can retreat to and we can ignore this topic. Just think of all the good things that come with being part of a church and, and being saved. You know, we, we love the fun activities that we have. We love the classes we get to go to. We love our life groups. We love uh, getting together. We love Easter dramas. We love all of these good things. We love the music that we get to listen to. We love 1049 The River, right? Positive and encouraging. It's always uplifting, right? Uh, these are things we, we, we can always look to the positive side. We love fellowships. We love that we have friends to laugh with. There's a lot of good things that come with being a Christian. If we are not careful, we can completely ignore the doctrines and the teachings of the Scripture when it comes to hell. It's uh, so severe and so serious, and Jesus spoke on the topic so often. It's easy to forget about hell. So I'm going to answer the question as we get into it. The, 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 tonight's topic is why do people go to hell, but what is hell? What is hell? Is hell here on earth? You know, there are some Bible teachers, even uh, so-called Bible teachers, that will say this is hell today. We're, we're already here in hell. Some say that hell is simply a state of mind. It's just, uh, just an idea. Uh, maybe it's something to fear. It's just, just something that we think about in our minds, but it's not real. But what does the Bible say about this place? Let's take a look, and I want you to follow along for these passages. In Matthew chapter 25, is where we'll start off. Matthew 25, <coughs> man. Matthew 25. Verse 41, Matthew 25, verse 41, let's actually look in verse 40, the Bible says, and this is Jesus speaking, and the king shall answer and say unto them, verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41, we, we start to see some descriptive words. The Bible is very descriptive. And it's kind of in, in different passages and places where the Bible talks about what happens after we die and what happens at the end when people are meeting God? And here he's uh, separating the, the ones on the right and the ones on the left. And to some he says, depart from me. The Bible uses the word everlasting. What does everlasting mean? Forever. Forever. Nonstop. Forever and ever and ever. It's a, hell is a place you spend forever. The Bible says hell is a place... Prepare for the devil and his angels. You know, God created this place intentionally. There was a purpose for it. Uh, the Bible says it was prepared. It was uh, thought out. It wasn't thought out for you and me to be a place where we should go, but it was intentionally prepared for a specific group. It was prepared for the devil, an angel that had fallen in pride, and all those that followed him with it. That's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus tells us about hell. If you turn back a little bit further in Matthew to chapter 8, verse 12, there's another mention of hell. Matthew 8, 12, the Bible says, But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. It's a description of darkness of hell. Uh, and that descriptor, outer darkness, the idea that we will be separated from God, the light of the world, that, that, that our relationship with Him will not be existent. It's outer darkness. The Bible says there shall be weeping. That's crying. That's wailing. And the Bible says gnashing 
of teeth. The word gnashing, that's a terrible word. That just sounds bad, but it's, uh, it means grinding of teeth. It's that uh, dealing with pain and bearing under a, a, a great torment. In Revelation chapter 20, we see some other descriptors of this place called hell. Revelation 20, verse 10. The Bible says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Well, that makes sense because this is a place that was prepared for him. That's great. You know, that's what we want. Uh, we want the, the beast and the false prophet there. We want Satan there. Revelation 20:15. Uh, it's a very sad verse, but it concludes this passage of a picture of the end times. And it says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It's a place that was prepared for the devil, prepared for his angels, but those that weren't written in this book of life, they are cast there as well. The Bible uses the, the picture, a lake of fire. Just think about that, the imagery there. Um, we all know the picture of a lake, but a flaming lake, a lake of fire. The Bible uses the word brimstone. Brimstone is uh, sulfur. It's a, uh, uh, a substance that burns. Um, the Bible uses this word here that in this lake of fire and brimstone that there is tormenting going on day and night. <coughs> you think of tormenting, that is a severe physical or mental suffering, the, the idea that the pain doesn't stop, the torment is day and it's constant, it's just very severe. One of the most uh, clear pictures that we relate to is found in Luke chapter 16, and we'll, we'll be there for a little bit of length here. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells a story, but he tells it in a way that's different than other stories that he told. Uh, the Bible describes it as a, a true story, uh, a certain rich man. Luke 16, verse 19. The Bible says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. He was living the good life, right? And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which laid at his gate full of sores. Doesn't sound so pleasant. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. It's just a terrible picture of you know, you've got this one living lavishly and you've got another in great poverty, having uh, just a, a sad, a tormented life here on earth. Verse 22, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Listen to this description. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Look in verse 27. Then he said, he says, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. In this passage, we see this clear description that when people die, there's, there's locations that they go to, their soul goes to a Location and the rich man went to hell. The beggar went to Abraham's bosom. There's a whole another 
uh, teaching that I could teach about that, explaining uh, what it was like, you know, before uh, Jesus died and rose again with that Abraham's bosom uh, description. But this description of hell, again, is a place, the Bible says he lift up his eyes. It's a place of awareness. It's a place where he was aware of what was taking place. He, he was aware of the torment. He was aware of his family and his friends. He had feelings. The, he uses the word that he is tormented in this flame. Uh, now, I read it very calmly. I, I can only imagine that the, the, the crying out for his brothers and the crying out for the water was not just a simple, you know, monotone description. He's tormented. He's screaming. He's yelling out for this. So this is what hell is. Hell is a place. Hell is a lake of fire. Hell is a place of darkness. Hell is a place of torment. The question is, why do people go there? Why do people go to hell? It wasn't a place created for people, so why do people go there? Help me answer this question. Do good people go to hell? No. Ooh, we're divided. I figured so. Uh, do good people go to hell? Listen, uh, if, you're, if you're taking notes, this is point number one. Point number one that I have to answer the question, we've got to remember that people are sinners. People are sinners. Do good people go to hell? No, sinners do. Sinners go to hell. The Bible talks about in Romans 3, verse 10, and, and you can turn there. In Romans 3, 10, it's described, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no person on this planet that can be deemed righteous of their own account. No, no person is completely perfect. No person is righteous as God is righteous. Romans 3.11 says, There is none that understandeth. There is none that seek after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. You see, us humans, we have many times a, a misunderstanding of our status before God. Uh, we have a misunderstanding of our sin. We often misjudge how severe sin really is in God's sight. Uh, and and we, we know that every person is a sinner. Uh, we're, we're born sinners. The Bible says that when Adam and Eve sinned, that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Adam sinned, and every person after that inherited this sin nature. That's who we are. That's what we do. And it's personal in nature. It's your sin. It's, it's my sin. We personally have a responsibility for our sin. In 1 John 1, 5, the Bible says, This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. It goes along a lot with what Pastor Tony was saying. How much unrighteousness is in God? None. None. How, how much sin can God allow to, to be part of Himself? None. God is perfectly holy. He, uh, in Isaiah 6.3, this is actually a verse Pastor Tony shared, uh, and one cried unto another, talking about these angels, uh, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Uh, God is holy in His nature. And sin is the opposite of that holiness. Uh, and we so often just misjudge how severe our sin really is. We, we have this misunderstanding that we're just good people trying to do our best. But the Bible even describes our righteousness as filthy rags. Even the best that we have to offer in our sinfulness is filthy before God's sight. Uh, sin is filthy before Him. Uh, in the, I have a book. It's called Basic Theology by Charles Ryrie. Okay? Uh, it goes through and it defines uh, many doctrines of uh, the Bible. And it had several definitions of the word sin. Sin is used hundreds and hundreds of times in the Bible. It's one of the most common words that we know as Christians. These are some definitions of the word sin. Sin is missing the mark. It's where God's perfection and God's holiness and God's law says uh, 
you know, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, but we miss the mark. Thou shalt not lie, but we lie. Thou shalt not steal, but we steal. Sin is missing the mark. Uh, it's also defined as badness, just the general state of evil. It's defined as rebellion against God, iniquity. It's a word used for sin. Going astray. It's where there is a path of godliness and we don't go that way, okay? Uh, it, it is defined as wickedness, as wandering, ungodliness, lawlessness, ignorance, and falling away. See, the, the chief description and characteristic of sin is that it is directed against God. We sometimes just can, can ignore that fact and say, well, I sinned against this person if I stole something from them, or I lied to this person, so my sin is against them, or uh, something like that. Every sin in its very nature is indirect, directly against God. We have to realize that. When we sin, the sin isn't just against people. It is a sin against a holy God who created us. Does anyone in here uh, hate sin? Would you be willing to say, I hate sin? Amen. Anyway, I hate sin. We hate what sin does to people that we love, Amen. don't we? It ruins relationships. It causes fighting and just terrible things. We hate the guilt that sin brings. We hate how it makes us feel. Uh, we hate how sin tears our world apart right now. We just see confusion and chaos in different people's lives and things going on in culture. We, we have an ability to say we hate sin. But we need to remember that none of us hate sin as much as God hates sin. It is so directly opposed to who He is. Um, there, uh, there are certain things that I would say I absolutely hate. Up until recently, I would tell you that I hate dog hair, okay? Uh, listen, I, I had dogs growing up, and I, I went to college, and there were no dogs in college. And I came to love, love, love that all my clothes were clean. They had no little hairy, furry things all over them. And when I would go back to my mom's house, and uh, when I was getting to know Tricia, I would despise those dogs. To me, they were filthy. They were nasty. They were disgusting. They had hair everywhere, and I wanted to stay away from dog hair. Isn't it? Do you hate anything like that? Amen. Yeah? What do you all hate? Cat hair. Cat hair. Okay. <laughs> dog hair, cat hair, anything besides animals? Huh? We hate things. We hate, so we have these passions against something. Um, sadly enough, I, I caved and bought a dog this past week, so... I like my little dog, but it's two different breeds that don't shed, and I may have a dog-free home, or a hair-free home, not dog-free, but uh, it's uh, not hairless. Might as well be, but we, we understand they don't shed. Uh, don't say that. Somebody keep him quiet. Um, don't be hating on me. We understand what it feels like to just in our gut to just despise something, right? Yes. Um, as much as we can understand hate to that degree, whatever it is you hate, uh, we can never understand how much uh, God is opposed to and separate from sin, okay? Uh, he is completely holy, completely sinless, and it cannot be in His presence. It cannot be. Uh, the Bible actually says in Habakkuk 1.13, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Sin is so filthy and terrible in God's sight. Now, remember I'm saying sin. I'm not saying sinners. It's so terrible in God's sight, He can't look at it. Uh, many, many people believe that when Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me on the cross? They believe that that was at the moment when all of our sin was placed on Christ. And the Bible says He became sin for us who knew no sin. And that's at the point where God the Father, in some way that we can't quite understand, had to turn His back on Jesus Christ, had to forsake Him because of the sin. We, we have to understand then that sin is something that God hates very strongly, more than we could ever, ever hate. Sin is so damaging, so terrible, 
so severe that only the death of God's Son can take it away. Think about that. There's no good deed we could ever do to take it away. There's no amount of asking uh, to, for, for just, there's no, no amount of good deeds that we could ever do. There's no amount of working that we could ever accomplish. No amount of money you could give to church that could ever, ever forgive your sin. It was only the death of a perfect Son of God that could ever take the sin away. Why do people go to hell? Number one, we have to remember that people are sinners. Number two, we need to remember that God is just and requires a payment for our sin. Uh, this is just the place that we find ourselves as humans in this condition. In Genesis chapter 2, it all starts back there with good old Adam. We're so thankful for that guy, right? Uh, you think, man, why, why did that have to happen? It did. And we, we're experiencing consequences of sin today. In Genesis 2, verse 16, the Bible says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Adam, Eve, eat of every tree that you want to eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Okay? Uh, he said, you have complete freedom. Do what you want. Eat of the tree you want, except for one. And do you know what Adam and Eve did? Yep. I hope so. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll share with you if you don't. They disobeyed God. They sinned. They defied their creator. And the Bible says that they died. They didn't die physically, but they died spiritually. And we find ourselves before Christ in a, in a, in a state of spiritual death. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.1, speaking to Christians, he says, And you hath he quickened. He, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Uh, people that don't know Christ are dead, spiritually dead, spiritually separated from God because of their sin. They are dead. The, the Bible says that for the, this sin that we have, this sin nature, that the penalty for sin is death. A spiritual death. That's what happened with Adam and Eve. That's what we've earned. That's what we have before Christ. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Does anyone in here like wages? Yes, we do. We love to work and get paid, okay? Uh, it's what you get for what you do. The wages, the payment, what you earn for sin is spiritual death. It's what's required. The, uh, the Bible says... Death is, uh, it's, it's, it talks about it as a spiritual death, meaning a separation from the life of God in this present life. And if that, condi that condition of spiritual death continues throughout life and you die physically, then eternal death, or what the Bible describes as the second death, is what follows. A forever death uh, where we're separated from God, where we read in Revelation 20, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Listen, God is a just judge. He is a holy God, and He requires payment for sin. This is where it gets tough. We cannot change the way God operates. Many times we don't understand why God operates that way. Why can't everyone get into heaven? Why can't everyone just be saved automatically? That's not the way God has set this thing up to operate. But He requires that sin be paid for. But here's the thing. <clears throat> uh, if we left it here without a final explanation, we would be a hopeless people. God would seem like a tormentor to create people and allow them to be sinners. And with only one option as hell, he would seem like a, a tormentor or a bully of his creation. But that's only one side of the story. God is just. He is holy. But number three, God is merciful and has made a way for all men to be forgiven through Christ. Listen, that is the side of the story that we love to relish in. And I've got to explain it. Romans 6.23 said, The wages of sin is death. We earn death. We get that. But the gift of God is eternal life 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. By means of what Jesus did, we have this other option, this other way out that God has made possible. Can you? The only way sin could be paid for was by the death of God's Son on the cross. And you know what? God made that option available. He did that. He was merciful to us. He didn't give us what we deserved. God doesn't want any single person to experience the punishment of their sin in hell. Can you say amen to that? Amen. He doesn't, there's not one person on this earth that God wants to go to hell. He created that place for the devil and his angels. And he went at the, at the greatest of great lengths to make it possible for every person to be saved. Now, there's more questions. Well, what about the people that never, ever hear about Christ? You know, nobody goes to hell because they haven't heard. That's not the reason. People go to hell because of their sin nature. It's the sin. Sin it requires a payment. That's the way it is. And I can't explain everything. And I don't understand everything. But God has gone to the greatest of lengths to make this offer of Christ available. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus was buried. Jesus rose from the dead. And with Christ, uh, we allow Jesus to take our punishment. Remember, the wage is death. Jesus died. And if you receive Christ, then that punishment is paid. John chapter 3, verse 16. You all know this one very well. For God so loved the world. We've got to remember that. Uh, there are many that would think God is why God sends people to hell. God allows these terrible things to happen. No, God, yes, He's a God of, of justice and He's a holy God, but He loved the world. He so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, the, this hell that we speak about, that we read about, is an everlasting place. It's a forever place. But heaven and eternal life is just as long. It is forever and it's available. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. See, God is merciful. He's made a way for all men to be forgiven through Christ. Without Christ, if someone dies... They have to experience the punishment for their own sin. But with Christ, the punishment for sin is already paid. So here's the answer to the question. Why do people go to hell? People go to hell simply because they have not accepted Christ and their sinfulness deserves a just punishment from an eternal, holy God. That's the answer. Um, we do not want to think about that. Does anybody want to think about that on a daily basis? We don't. We want to ignore that. We want to run from that. We, we don't want to be a part of that. In Luke chapter 16, uh, verses 27 and 28, I want to, I want to read this again. This is uh, what I believe to be the only testimony we have from someone in hell, from someone that is experiencing the, the weight and the punishment of their own sin. Luke chapter 16, verse 27. I already read it before, but he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. The one testimony of a person in hell that we have is that he's saying, go tell my brothers, my family, I do not want them to come here. And uh, this is uh, one of those doctrines, this is one of those teachings of Scripture we can't ignore. If we ignore this, we don't love the people we say we love. We don't care for the people we say we care about. If we ignore this, we're, we're uh, acting as if we believe another gospel, one that doesn't include the judgment of God. The reason that salvation is so great is because we're saved from something. We're saved from hell. Do you understand? So what do we do? How do we, how do we respond to this? We, we do what he asks here. He says, I have five brethren. Send them that he may testify. We need to testify. 
We need to speak to people when we have the opportunity to speak to people about this place and about the Savior that's available to them. Do you agree with that? We need to warn. Uh, we, we, this, is, this, is, this is requires a warning. Uh, this is why we have children's ministry. This is why we have church. This is why we go to Walmart. This is why we do all that we do is because this is a warning. We, the people have to know about this. Uh, it doesn't make sense to people when you shout uh, just that God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. It's important to know that. But salvation is, you, you cannot get saved until you realize what you're saved from. You're saved from the punishment of your sin. That's why Jesus came. We've got to warn people about that. In 2 Corinthians 6.2, the Bible speaks. He says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. In John 9, verse 4, the Bible says, I must work the works of Him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Here's what I would tell you. Time is limited. Time is limited. Um, uh, I don't want to make it too personal, but we know uh, Perry Harding passed away. That man made use of his time. Uh, he was still visiting uh, people. He would come by and get a list of people to visit and talk to uh, that, that needed visited here at the church, uh, new people, people that uh, may not be saved. And, and that was his goal, was to, to warn people. We have a limited amount of time. There is no time to uh, live in sin. There's no time to just show up for church. There is something that we need to share, uh, something we need to warn people about. So have conversations that matter when you have the opportunity. We need to pray. Uh, we, we've got people in our church even now that are praying for lost loved ones. And many times we just think, I'll get to that when I get to it. Uh, you know, we go to family uh, reunions and family events, and we just don't concern ourselves with that. Uh, let's focus better on the presents and the birthday cakes and the, the fun things. But this is so important. It's a question of where people will spend forever. Uh, we, we need to pray. We need to walk closely with God, and we must share the gospel.